I call leadership the challenge to be something more than mediocre. The step up to the new challenge, the new opportunity. It was said of Abraham Lincoln. He was at his mother's bedside when she died, and her last words were, Be somebody, Abe. And if that story is true, evidently he took it to heart and proceeded from that moment to become somebody. And that's the key to leadership. Inner inspection of your gifts and your skills, your integrity and your character. The outer look at how you present yourself as you appear. In some of our other lectures, we go through this whole scenario. The inside is important, but also the outside is important. When you meet somebody for the first time, first thing they're going to do is take a look. Now, sure, they're going to listen, but then they're going to take a look. Now, certainly we learn to evaluate people by more than what we see, but at first we're going to take a look. Let me quote you an ancient phrase. It says, people look on the outside, God looks on the inside. Isn't that excellent information? That's excellent information. So that might mean work on the inside for God, work on the outside for people. You say, well, people shouldn't judge you by your appearance. Well, let me give you a clue. They do. <laughs> they do. You can't deal in shoulds and shouldn'ts. You've got to deal in realities. Now, when people get to know you, they'll judge you by more than what they see. But at first, it's all they got to go by is what they see and what they hear. Now, sure, there's more to come. But at first, you got to pass the show up test, the challenge to be somebody. Let me just give you a brief list. Be somebody wise. There's no substitute for smart. Threats don't make up for smart. Right? Volume and shouting doesn't make up for smart. There's no substitute for smart. Be somebody strong. Strength is attractive. And there are many ways to be strong. Decision making, character, language, right? as well as vitality and health. There's a lot of strengths and they're all attractive. But let me give you now the refinement of leadership skills. Here it is. Learn to be strong, but not rude. This is refinement. These are the extra steps to become a powerful, capable leader with wide range of reach. Some people mistake rudeness for strength. It's not even a good substitute. Next, be kind, but not weak. We must not mistake weakness for kindness. Because kindness isn't weak. Kindness is a certain kind of strength. We must be kind enough to tell somebody the truth. We must be kind enough and considerate enough to lay it on the line. We must be kind enough to tell it like it is and not deal in delusions. That's a sense of kindness. Not weakness, but kindness. Next, learn to be bold, but not a bully. It does take boldness to win the day, to become a leader. You got to stride out front. You got to be willing to take first arrows. You got to be willing to take first problem, first trouble, leading the way. You must boldly seize the spring. Now, farming is not an easy task. You must press the seeds into the soil. I think all of us would relate farming to hard work. It's hard work planting the seed. Letting it grow, defending it against all of the encroachments of bugs and weeds. We call it not an easy task, but that's one of the best illustrations I know of of life. If you want any value at all, come harvest. You got to press. You got to be bold. You got to seize it. The high life is not for the timid and the shy. Here's the next one. Be humble, but not timid. Some people mistake timidity for humility. But humility is a virtue. Timidity is a disease. It's a malady. It's an affliction. Now it can be cured, but it is a problem. But humility is a almost godlike word, a sense of awe, a sense of wonder, a sense of dimension, of a sense of understanding the distance in worth and value, an awareness of the human soul, the spirit, something unique about the human drama versus the rest of life. Humility is a grasp of the distance between us and the stars, and yet having the feeling that we're part of the stars. Next, be thoughtful but not lazy. 
It's okay to dream, but we must not just become a dreamer. Here's a good refinement. Be proud, but not arrogant. It takes pride to win the day. It takes pride in company, philosophy, opportunity. It takes pride in community, school. It takes pride in group, organization. It takes pride in cause and accomplishment. But the key is to be proud without being arrogant. Do you know the worst kind of arrogance? Arrogance from ignorance. It's hardly tolerable, right? Next, deal in realities. Deal in truth. Save yourself the agony. Just accept it like it is. Life is fairly unique. Accept it as unique. Now, best to call it unique. Some people call it tragic, but I, it's best to call it unique. The black widow spider eats her mate after he's finished his noble task. Now, some people call that awful. I, I think it's more important to call it unique. The whole drama of life is, is unique. Here's some stuff that saved me a lot of agony and a lot of anguish and a lot of sleepless nights I used to go through and pulling my hair and wondering, wondering, wondering. I gave up on all that when I finally understood the 80-20 rule. Let me give some good clues on the 80-20 rule. As a leader, as a manager, being able to influence other people in this 80-20 group, here are some clues. Learn to spend 80% of your time as a leader with the 20%. For maximum efficiency and productivity, this is part of the key. Since it's going to be 80-20, and there's plenty of examples to show that it's 80-20. Not exactly, but fairly close. Ask the minister of the church, who picks up the tab here? And he'll say, probably, 20% of the people pick up 80% of the tab. I mean, this is called one of those things, okay? So what do you do? Well, you learn to work with it and not try to solve it. It's like trying to solve the seasons. You don't solve the seasons, you learn to work with the seasons. They're all set. And some of these things by history are all set. The key is to learn to work with the way it is set. So part of the key of leadership is learning to spend 80% of your time with the 20% because they're doing the 80%. We would call that good leadership sense. Now you say, well, how do you do that? Let me give you part of the answer in how to do that. Here it is. Spend individual time with the 20% and group time with the 80%. This is part of the answer to leadership skills. However, guess who wants your individual time? The wrong group. But that's what life's all about, right? Accepting this challenge. So now you've got to be what we call clever. And you've got to be, another key word, diplomatic. Diplomacy and strategy are two key words for leadership to understand. Diplomacy and strategy. Here's part of the diplomacy. Mary comes and says, I've got a question. You say, Mary, bring your question Saturday morning. I'm going to meet with everybody and I'll cover it then. She says, okay. Now it might not be that easy, but if you start trying to put this in perspective now, groups, you can deal with the 80% by groups and you can talk to the 20% individual. Now the pull is in the opposite direction and it always is. Now somebody says, well, I'll just fire the 80%. They're only doing 20% of the business. Well, I wouldn't fool with that. Because after you've fired the 80%, before too long, whoever is left, 20% of them will be doing 80% of the business, and 80% will be doing 20%. All right, this is not something you fire. This is something you learn to work with. The 80-20 rule, very important rule. The next subject is called the law of averages. So important to understand the law of averages. The law of averages in a personal sense is, is very simple. Here's what it says. If you do something often enough, you'll get a ratio of results. It's important for leaders to understand ratio. Because if you're working with people, you gotta have some charts, you gotta know ratios, you got to be able to evaluate your own performance, their performance. Ratios, what do we mean by ratios? Well, let's say you're in sales, you join a company and you start representing the products or the service, and you're first getting started, you talk to 10 people, nine say, no, I wouldn't care for any, one says, yes, I'll take some. We call this your opening ratio. You say, well, that's not too good a ratio. Well, it all depends, okay? But it's your opening ratio. So at first, you don't worry about what the numbers are. At first, you just get some activity going. Now, we call this very simply one out of 10. Now, here's what's very exciting about dealing in ratios. Once a ratio starts, it tends to continue. Now, this is some things leadership needs to know so that you're not frustrated. If you talk to 10 people, one says yes. If you talk to 10 more, chances excellent, you'll get another one. If you talk to 10 more, chances excellent, you'll get another one. 
It's uncanny. I don't even know how it works. All I know is it works. There's a lot of things you don't need to know how they work. Just work them. Right? A lot of people are studying the roots. Others are gathering the fruit. I mean, it depends on what end of this you want to get in on. It just works. It's a fascinating subject. The law of averages. Okay? Now, once you know that your ratio pretty well is in there, one out of ten, now you can start to compete. It is so important to compete, to test your skill against someone else's skill. What someone else can do is a pretty good insight and if you stretch what you might be able to do. So competition is a very healthy thing. Now, you've got to be very smart here. If you've been with this company, let's say, a long time and you've been there so long, you're so good, you can get nine out of ten, and I just joined and I can only get one out of ten, if we have a 30-day contest as to who can get the most to say yes to our product or service, if we have a 30-day contest, you and me, even though I can only get one out of ten, I will win. You say, well, I've been here a long time, I can get nine out of ten. How could you possibly beat me? It would be very simple. Now, it might not be easy, but it would be very simple. During the 30 days, since I understand now these ratios, during the month, while you talk to 10 and get 9, I will talk to 100 and get 10. So that at the end of 30 days, you got 9, I got 10, I beat you. Isn't that clever? <laughs> Let me give you a scenario here. If you're bright, what you do if you're new, you make up in numbers what you lack in skill. This is called helping people with the numbers, helping people with ratios. Someone says, well, I can only get 1 out of 10. Say, that's got nothing to do with competition. The key is to be bright enough to understand ratios. Here's the next clue. Ratios can be increased. You talk to 10, get one. Talk to 10, get one. Talk to 10, get one. Talk to 10 more, get two. Why would about the fourth time you talk to 10, you get two instead of one? You're getting better. Key question, who can get better? Answer, anybody who tries. All you got to do is put together the numbers, right? Your brain is as good as anybody else's. Your chances are as good. All you got to do is find a way to put out the extraordinary effort to do an ordinary thing extremely well. Ratios. Success is a numbers game. It's important to keep track of your numbers. In baseball, we call it batting average. Whatever you're doing, the key is to keep track of your success and how good you are at whatever. Someone says, well, I'm not very good on the telephone. I'll tell you how you can quickly cure all that, is get on the telephone. I'm telling you, you can get better at anything. All you've got to do is attempt it and try it and start putting a string of numbers together and keeping track and understand your own ratios. I teach a very simple sales course. Let me give it to you in three points. Number one, talk to lots of people every day. It's a simple sales course. Number one, talk to lots of people. Isn't that simple? It's a numbers game, especially if you're new. And here's what's exciting. There's lots of people. You don't have to worry about people. So just talk to lots of people, even if your presentation is very poor. If you put the numbers together, I'm telling you, something will happen. If your presentation was so poor, you went around every day saying to everybody you could meet, you wouldn't want to buy anything, would you? Sure enough, somebody's going to say, well, maybe I would. What are you selling? <laughs> I'm telling you, it's just about that simple if you put the numbers together. If you talk to lots of people every day, two things will happen. Number one, you're bound to make sales. And the reason is understanding the numbers. The numbers, you don't have to be so cleverly skillful. All you got to do is be bright enough to understand that numbers can make up for lack of skill to begin with. And if you're in a leadership position to help people, help them with their ratios. Say, John, let's go over these numbers one more time. How many calls? And who did you talk to? So that's my sales form. It's very simple. Number one, talk to lots of people every day. You're bound to get better. You're bound to find somebody. Number two, be real nice when the weather isn't. Be real nice when people aren't. A big part of presentation is attitude, and personality. And third is simple. Give good service. Write all the notes most people don't write. Do all the extra things most people don't do. Call them before they call you. Service leads to multiple sales. If you'll take good care of somebody, they'll open doors you could never open yourself. They'll take you by the hand and share you with people that you never thought you could reach. 
There's a unique story in the Bible. It's called the parable or the story of the sower. S-O-W-E-R. The sower in the ancient days was the person that planted the crops. Very simply, they got the ground ready and the sower with a bag of seed would walk across the ground, sow the seed. That's how they got the crops going. And it's a very fascinating story and it's got a lot to say and it's got a lot to say about our subject called the law of averages. There's some important points you'll pick up right away when you read the story. Here's number one. The sower was a wise man. A great advantage. They didn't send a dummy out to plant. Number two, he was very ambitious. And by the time you finish the story, you'll come to the conclusion he was ambitious. Admirable quality. Ambition. One writer said, I've learned to be both ambitious and content. That's a unique place to finally arrive, to be both ambitious and content. But this story says the sower was very ambitious. Nothing wrong with ambition, as long as you work the right formula. The sower was bright and he was also ambitious. Number three, he went to work. It takes activity to furnish the labor that brings new life. Ideas without labor are stillborn. They never become tangible. They never become real. You got to put yourself through the activity, through the labor. So when you read the story, you'll find this was a hardworking sower. We call that admirable quality. Now some interesting things that happened to the sower. It said he had excellent seed, point four. He had the best. At least the scenario of the story says he had the best of seed. Boy, it's exciting when you feel that you're involved in the best, the best product, the best service, the best idea, the best enterprise, something you feel proud about. Now with all of these qualities, he starts out and now starts to unfold the scenario of life called the law of averages. Here's what happened. The sower goes out to sow the seed and the first part of the seed that he sows falls by the wayside and the birds get it. Now, I want you to understand the scenario. Here's what's very important for leaders to engage in, to teach the inevitable. It's very important to teach the inevitable. Key for leadership. Leaders must understand birds. <laughs> Why? Birds are going to get part of the seed. It's called inevitable. And if you don't teach inevitability, people will be all upset. They won't know what to expect. We must all be prepared for what we call eventualities, the inevitable. So here's part of the scenario. The sower goes out to sow the seed and the birds get some. He sows some more seed and the birds get it. Now, this is a typical story of life. Is that fairly typical? Fairly typical. The birds are going to get some of the seed. Some of you building an organization, right? You're out recruiting. Say, John, I've got an important story for you to listen to. Could be the change of your life earn some extra money or make it a full-time venture, whatever, but come and take a look. And he says, well, hey, I think I'm ready for something like that. Thursday night, I'll see you and let's go through it all. You say, wonderful. Comes Thursday night. John isn't there. You say, where is John? The birds, the birds. The birds. Uh, who knows what form they come in? I don't know. It's called the inevitable, the inevitable. His brother-in-law said, sales, you're not going to get mixed up in sales. Who told you you were a salesman? All kinds of stuff that talk people out of a good idea. I don't know. Now, when the birds get some of the seed, you got one of a couple of choices. Number one, you can chase birds. You say, well, I'll go straighten this out. Well, here's the problem if you go try chasing birds to straighten things out. You have now left the field. And the law of averages isn't going to work for you anymore till you get back to the field. This is so important to know what to spend your time on and what not to waste your time on. The best thing to do is to spend your energy and time on the things that count and understand the law of averages, okay? And not chase the birds, but to stay in the field. Here's what it said the wise man did. He ignored the birds and he kept on sowing. Why? He was so bright, he understood the law of averages. Now here was some more of his experiences. Now he keeps on sowing the seed. Now the seed falls on rocky ground and the soil was shallow. We call this inevitable. I don't know how to miss this. 
This is called the stuff of life. It's so important to understand the seasons and the stuff of life and the ratios and the inevitables. This is so important, especially as a leader, so that you can help people through understanding how it is. And it said this time the seed takes root and the little plant starts to grow, but the soil is so shallow that the first hot day, the little plants wither and die. You say, wow, what a disappointment. Well, sure, you're going to be disappointed. Some people are going to try so little, even if you've got a good idea. 30 days later, you say, we had this meeting. John wasn't here. So where is John? I said, I don't know. You say, well, I thought sure John had last 30 days. But he didn't. Why? It's called inevitable. Right. And who knows the reason why? John isn't here anymore. Somebody said, boo. <laughs> and he quit. He quit. First hot day. Now, you're going to be disappointed, especially if it's somebody you like, somebody you know. But here's what you must learn to do as a leader. Discipline your disappointment. This is part of the challenge of life. Disciplining the disappointment understanding the law of averages. Now, here's what it said the wise man did. He kept on sowing. How brilliant. He was so well schooled in the law of averages. Now, this time he sows the seed, it falls on thorny ground, and the little plant starts to grow, but the thorns choke it to death and it dies. Wow, what's this called? The inevitable. Do you know what the story called the thorns? The cares of life, little cares. Who knows the excuses some people use for not pushing on through and getting the job done? It's called inevitable. Some people are going to try so little. They're going to let other things crowd out the good opportunities. I, and who knows why? I don't know why. I'm an amateur on this stuff. The key is to take the inevitable and take the obvious, right? Everybody should take obvious one, obvious two, <laughs> right? And study the obvious and not let it unduly disturb you and learn to manage the obvious so you can get on with the more important things in life. I call John up. I say, John, where were you last night? We had this meeting. John says, well, I can't make every meeting. I say, why not? John says, well, I got a lot of other things I got to do. I say, what are they? You won't believe the list John gave you. <laughs> the backyard fence was sagging and the dogs were about to get loose. You just can't let your dogs run loose. I say, okay, John. <laughs> John says, the screen door came off the hinges. And you just can't let things fall apart. You've got to take time, keep things fixed up. I say, okay, John. Some extra trash piled up in the garage. You just can't let mountains of trash take over. You've got to take care of your trash. I say, okay, John. Some people have the incredible ability to major in minor things. I don't know why we call this inevitable. We call it a mystery. It's part of the scenario of life. The scenario of the story of the sower is to prepare us for the inevitable called the law of averages. Now here's what it says. The sower kept on sowing. He was so bright. Evidently, he'd been schooled in these numbers of about how many are going to let the birds and about how many the hot weather is going to take and about how many are going to let little things cheat him out of big chances. He must have gone through the school because he understood. He kept on sowing. Now here's what it says. The seed falls on good ground. Let me give you a promise as a leader. It always will. Key phrase. If you share a good idea often enough, it'll fall on good people. Why? The law of averages. Now, even the good ground had a variety of productivity. It said part of the good ground produced 30%. Wow. And it said part of the good ground produced 60%. Terrific. And it said part of the good ground produced 100%. What's that called? The law of averages. That's the way it is. It's called one of those things. Now, can you find some 100 percenters? The answer is yes, but you got to go through the birds and the hot weather and the thorns and cares. And you've got to find some way to use the 30 percenters and the 60 percenters. And if now if you become entrusted as a skillful leader and learn the law of averages and learn how to deal with all this, you'll have some 100 percenters to deal with, to work with. Leaders must understand 
the fact that there is both good and evil. It's part of the life scenario to understand good and evil. And however you wish to describe good and however you wish to frame your ideology of evil, there are a lot of ways to put it. For some people, evil is too strong a word. I don't know. This is part of your own philosophical conclusions that you have to come to in trying to evaluate this earthly struggle. Evil, good, tyranny, liberty, sickness, health, winning, losing, life, death, opportunity, tragedy. It's part of the life scenario. And all good leaders must understand this clash, this scenario however you wish to describe it, whatever terms you wish to call it. We must understand it. Now, here's part of the understanding. Some people have sold out to the evil side for whatever reason. You don't have to spend much time with why. All you have to do is spend time with who. I went to my 30th year class reunion a few years ago. Little small village, right, I grew up in. There was only about 150 in the graduating class. And after 30 years, almost half of the graduating class was at the reunion, which was pretty good. We had a two-day celebration. I'm master of ceremonies. On the second day, we had a little moment to remember those who had deceased. I think there were eight. And I knew them all, so I gave a little scenario, a little story about each one. And then we took time, just a little moment of silence to remember, because some of them were very, very unique human beings, but they were gone. I thought later, eight out of 150 after 30 years. Is that about average? Guess what I discovered? It's about average. So after 30 years out of 150, it's not will eight be missing, it is only who will be missing. So in part of the scenario of understanding leadership, the key is to not be surprised when the inevitable occurs. Because if you become too surprised, we will call you naive. And it's very sobering as to why some have chosen to give themselves over to evil. And we call it simply one of those things. But the key to leadership is to understand. And the key to leadership is to also be alert and be bright enough to spot it and to see it. All good leaders must understand the story of the frog and the scorpion. It's one of the most important stories for a leader to understand. According to the story of the frog and the scorpion, the story scenario says, the frog and the scorpion appeared on the bank of a river about the same time, and the frog was about to jump in the river and swim to the other side. And along comes the scorpion, and he sees what's about to happen, and he engages the frog in conversation, and the scorpion says to the frog, Mr. Frog, I see that you're about to jump in the river and swim to the other side. And the frog said to the scorpion, that is correct. And the scorpion said, hey, hey, hold it. I would like to get to the other side, but unfortunately I'm a scorpion and I can't swim. Would you be so kind as to let me hop on your back and you swim across the river and deposit me on the other side? I would be grateful. And the frog looked at the scorpion and said, no way. The frog said, you're a scorpion, and scorpions sting frogs and kill them. He said, I'd get out there halfway with you on my back, and you'd sting me, and I'd die. You think I'm crazy? No way. The scorpion said, hey, hey, hold it, hold it. With your frog brain, you're not thinking. <laughs> if I was to sting you out there halfway, sure, you'd die and drown, but so would I, since I'm a scorpion and I can't swim. That'd be kind of foolish. So I'm not about to do that. I just want to get to the other side. The frog thought over that reasoning and said, that makes sense, hop on. And according to the story, the scorpion hops on the frog's back. They start across the river. And sure enough, halfway across the river, the scorpion stings the frog. The frog cannot believe <laughs> what happened. And he said to the scorpion, why did you do that? I'm about to die and drown, but so are you. Why would you do that? And the scorpion said, because I am a scorpion. So all leaders must understand the story of the frog and the scorpion.
There are shepherds and there are sheep and there are wolves and wise leaders must understand some wolves are so clever they've learned to dress up like sheep but do not miss the story of the full drama of life called good and evil it's part of the test of leadership skill awareness sensitivity understanding knowing the scenario and being on the alert for what is called the inevitable let me give you now just in sort of quick succession some studies that leaders should engage in. Let me just give you the list. We won't expand on this, but I'm sure you can expand on it in your own good time and in your own good way. But let me give you this list of studies leaders should engage in. Number one, the study of possibility. Possibility. It's so important for leaders to play the what if game. What if we had enough people? What if we had refined people? What if we had leaders? What if we had a good team? What if we went to the market? What if we accomplished our goal? What could we accomplish? What are the dimensions? What's the size? What's the promise? We call it the what if game. Possibilities are all around us. We must all be students of possibility. It's not a bad subject for study, possibilities. Number two is opportunity. Leaders must always be conscious and aware of the expanded potential for opportunity. And sometimes opportunity is closer than you think. The next subject of study is ability. Leaders must be good students of ability, their ability, and the people that are in their charge, their influence, their ability. Sometimes it's easy to have somebody right close to you and you've never discovered all of their talent and their potential. I discovered a young man in Canada, Harold Dyke, many years ago. He worked for the railroad. I think he was making about $300 a month. He'd been there 10 years. Now, this was a long time ago. But I discovered him, he became a good friend of mine, and I recruited him. And he joined my company, joined my business. The second year he was with me, he made $45,000. And now he's a leader in the community, and he's gifted and skillful, and he's financially independent, and he's a unique gentleman. Now the railroad had him for 10 years. They didn't have this in-depth survey of trying to find the people that are right close around who may have some unusual gifts and capacities that nobody has yet discovered. So leaders must be students of ability and find ways to uncover somebody's unusual ability that may have been there for a while. And you've just got to find a way to uncover all of that. Part of the key to leadership. Subject number four, inevitability. All of us should be students of inevitability. Without kidding myself, if I keep up my current daily practices, where will it take me in 10 years without being disillusioned? I don't want to just cross my fingers and walk the wrong road. I got to learn to look into the future called inevitable. Inevitability is being 200 feet from Niagara Falls in a little boat with no motor and no oars. It's called it's over now the key to that tragic story and scenario is what a tragic place to find yourself if somebody would have painted you this scene when you were still upstream and painted the roar of the falls in your mind and would show you what a tragic place it is you might not have drifted this far into what we call now the inevitable we've got to help people by painting the roar of the falls long before they get 200 feet in a little boat with no motor and no oars. You say, well, the roar of the falls is a long ways off. Yes, but the people that are around you are drifting, drifting. And by perception, you've got to see it. And you've got to level, and you've got to speak the truth so that you can give them alternate choices while there are still alternate choices. It's called the gift of leadership, helping people in life change, career change, helping people in thinking change, helping people with attitude change, to paint the inevitable. It's a key to leadership. Number five, an important subject for leaders to study is called rationality. Being able to rightly conclude based on information a rational, sensible course. I've got a good clue for you. 
Make sure what you do is the product of your own conclusion. Take advice, but not orders. Let everybody around you be helpful, but then put that through your own mental computer and make sure what you do is the product of what you've concluded based on all the input. We call this a true sense of leadership, developing rationality based on all the input. These are not easy tasks, but they're tasks that are possible. This is called walking the summit of leadership skills. And most people don't want to engage in these extra disciplines, but I'm here to promise you that the treasure and the equity is so unique that what small price is paid in these early disciplines is small compared to the treasure that accumulates as the days unfold, both for your heart and your mind and your purse. To finish, let me give you some challenges. In wrapping all of this up, I've got some good challenges for you to consider. Here's the first one. Let other people lead small lives, but not you. In the challenge of leadership and stepping up to the responsibility and the opportunity to touch somebody else's life, let everybody else lead the small lives, but not you. Let everybody else cry over small hurts, but not you. Let everybody else argue over non-essentials, but not you. Deal in things that matter. The larger challenge the larger opportunity. Here's my next challenge. As leaders, let's learn to help people not just with their jobs, but with their lives. I think we have a twofold responsibility to help people with job skills. But I think the greater responsibility is to help people with life skills. Let's don't just teach people how to work. Let's teach people how to live, how to assimilate and accumulate far greater treasures than just a paycheck. The treasures of awareness, understanding, setting goals, reaching into the future, growing, changing, expanding. If we'll touch people's lives as well as their skills, if they stay with us a week or a month or a year or a lifetime, on whatever occasion they should choose to leave, you want them to leave by saying, my experience there was the greatest experience of my life. And it wasn't just what I earned, it was what I learned. And last, I have an ancient scenario to give you. It comes from the Bible, and here's what it says. If you work on your gifts, they will make room for you. If you practice your gifts, your gifts will make a place for you, a place of leadership a place of influence, a place to touch someone else, to make a mark, to further an enterprise, to build a dream. Someday, if you work on your gifts, we will call you noble. We may give you rewards you cannot even now imagine. Plaques to hang on your wall, trophies to remember, but most of all, the gift of knowing yourself, that you did the best you could with what you had, the expansion of your mind and your heart and your soul and your touch and your reach and all the gifts that you possess. Your gifts, if you work on them, will make a room for you. And I've got to be one of the better examples of that. Look where my gifts have brought me. I was raised in obscurity, a little small village in Idaho. I now get to travel around the world. My gifts have brought me to this room. And what an experience it is for me to have a chance to touch you. One of the most challenging experiences in life is seeing what you can do to help someone else. And one of the greatest thrills in life is to be able to invest life into life. And you've given me that opportunity tonight, and I want to thank you for that. Chẳng được quên khi cơn mưa đêm lại về Em nơi quên lời thề và ta như đông chìm sâu Không gần mới em anh nhận màu nhà Ooh, Em chỉ cần mưa đâu em bay Chỉ còn là những cơn mưa vô ra Cho bên mơ em không mơ hay nhẹ Anh một đêm mơ Chỉ cần bên em không được cơn nhớ Và trôi không còn nhớ Và người ta bên nhau như ngã tơ Yeah, 
got my mind in my mind She got me named in the coma
think I'm going crazy Don't think I'll get on safe So I'm taking six shots all straight to the face I'm taking six shots, are you coming with me? I'm taking six shots, get straight to the face And I wanna get lost, now I'm sick of this place Don't know how to stop when I'm feeling this way So I'm taking six shots till I'm feeling okay I think I'm going crazy Don't think I'll get on safe Taking six shots all straight to the face I'm taking six shots, are you coming with me? Sometimes you need to let loose, grab juice, get goose, tattoos, taboos, get screwed Loosen up, buttercup, all those hate comments will never make you feel enough We're all adequate graduates, hearts full of calluses, but we know calculus Damn, ain't that fabulous, can't wait to apply all those mathematicus but we can't get a job that pays us enough I'm about to pop up Fuck you, you're lost We all know that we never really want a boss So I'ma do what I want to Something I can't undo Yeah, I'ma do what I want to Something I can't undo I'm taking six shots, yeah, straight to the face And I wanna get lost, I'm sick of this place Don't know how to stop when I'm feeling this way So I'm taking six shots till I'm feeling okay I think I'm going crazy Don't think I'll get on safe So I'm taking six shots all straight to the face I'm taking six shots, are you coming with me? I'm taking six shots, yeah, straight to the face And I wanna get lost, I'm sick of this place, no 